let me give you a little bit of my story and then we can talk about science a little bit. Uh, so, okay, and the boy plays with fusion. Uh, how did this all start? Well, uh, I've been interested in science pretty much all my life, uh, since I was probably five or six years old, but nuclear science, that spark hit me when I was about 10 years old. Uh, now, what it was about science, I don't know, uh, or nuclear science, you know, what, what particularly drew me to nuclear science? Uh, I don't really know the, the answer to that, but you know, the kind of unlocked, untapped, uh, or that untapped energy that you can unlock inside every atom is, is a pretty powerful thing. If you look at the destruction that nuclear weaponry brought to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, if you look at the you know, hundreds of nuclear weapons that we let off in the desert. It's an incredible force to be reckoned with. And kind of knowing I could play around with that, uh, to me, was something really cool. And I figured out pretty quickly after I got into nuclear science that, yeah, I actually could play around with this strong nuclear force. Uh, so you can see some of the radioactive stuff I've collected, collected up in my garage there. Uh, this is my fusion reactor. So it took me about three years of, of kind of planning and researching and designing, uh, and then about a year of actual construction to build this reactor. Um, now how it works is basically this is a vacuum chamber, meaning there's no air inside. We suck all the air out, uh, or most of the air at least, to where there's no gas particles or very few gas particles that will get in the way of how this fusion reaction works. And then I put in a little bit of heavy hydrogen. It's called deuterium. It's just hydrogen with an extra neutron in the nucleus. And uh, it's a little bit easier to fuse together. Uh, and then I just charge up this center grid with very high voltage. We're talking 50 to 100,000 volts. Uh, and I can get this deuterium ionized, meaning I stripped off the electrons. So what charged electrons have? They have a Negative charge, correct. So now these deuterons, these charged deuterium ions, uh, have a positive charge because they lost those negatively charged electrons. And if I charge up this inner grid to a negative high voltage potential, I can slam those positive high voltage or those positive uh, deuterons towards the inner grid. And if they're going fast enough and they kind of meet head on uh, or meet with another uh, deuterium atom, uh, they can fuse together. And when they fuse together, they give off some byproducts, which I use in my research and I can talk about in a minute. But um, it's really cool. This is the power that powers everything you see around you. Uh, now, you may ask, how does that work? But if you think about it, all the energy that you have to work, these lights have to work, it all comes from the sun originally. And the sun is a giant fusion reactor. Now, that energy is being transformed from nuclear energy to, to, to uh, light to chemical energy, stored chemical potential energy inside plants that will then eat, uh, or it's trapped in coal, and then we burn the coal to produce the light that's lighting me right now. But really deep down, all the energy that you guys are using right now originally came from fusion. So if we could develop this into an energy source, uh, it would be the holy grail, in my opinion, of energy. It's clean, it doesn't emit uh, any carbon in the atmosphere, and it doesn't have a lot of radioactive waste like nuclear fission power plants have. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very powerful. Uh, it's, it's one of the most powerful things we can unleash, uh, but it's very clean, uh, and it's cheap, and it's abundant, and the fuels are everywhere. So. I've kind of dedicated my life to solving the problem of fusion. And it's a big problem. It's something we've been working on for decades and decades and decades, and we haven't solved it yet. But hopefully, that'll kind of be my contribution. So moving on a little bit of what I've done since then. Oh, well, that's my fusion reactor back there. Uh, this is my lab at the University of Nevada, Reno. That's where my fusion reactor is now. Um, control panel part you can see there. Uh, and then this is the inside of the reactor. You can see the plasma. Um, that's just the ionized gas. Uh, it's the state of matter that the electrons have been ripped away, and you have electrons and the ions, and they're all floating around. It's when you look up at the sun, well, don't look up at the sun. That's not very good for you. But if you look up at the sun, that's what you're looking at. Um, so this is a few of the things I've done with the reactor. So I've worked with fusion energy, but I've also done a lot of other things. Um, nuclear nonproliferation and counterterrorism. Well, what is that? So uh, if you look at uh, nuclear weapons, incredibly powerful, right? But you wouldn't want a terrorist to get their hands on one and detonate it in this country. It would kill thousands of times more people uh, than were killed in the attacks of 9-11, for example. So I've developed systems and detectors that are very, very cheap, very revolutionary, um, but they detect detect these nuclear materials or nuclear weapons inside, say, a cargo container. So uh, that's one of the things I've worked on. And the other thing is 
this, which looks like a lot of chaos, but this is actually a prototype to produce medical isotopes. So medical isotopes are these radioactive atoms that decay spontaneously, uh, and they can be used to treat or diagnose, say, cancer. Uh, now, they're really great. Problem is, because they're radioactive, they have a relatively short half-life, meaning they don't stick around for very long. Uh, so if you want to produce them, you can't stockpile them, so you have to go to these multi-million dollar facilities to produce them. Um, but I've developed this device, which costs less than $100,000. It wills into the hospital room and produces these same isotopes that it previously required these multi-million dollar facilities to create. So uh, both these things, the counterterrorism detectors, the medical isotope generation devices, uh, they're all kind of derivatives from my early fusion research. Um, but nuclear science, in my, in my opinion, has the potential to do a lot more than just energy production or counterterrorism or treat, uh, be a tool in the fight of cancer. I can do some other cool stuff too, so I'll just briefly go over these. Um, how many people watched Curiosity land on Mars? So a lot of you. It was actually really cool. I sat with my family kind of around the computer watching this thing descend onto the surface of Mars. It was quite a terrifying process and you know it was kind of up in the air as to whether or not it would work. But what is powering this minivan-sized rover that's sitting on the planet Mars about to do these really complex science missions. Does anybody know? Plutonium. plutonium. It's about five kilograms of plutonium-238. Now, this isn't the same plutonium that's in your average nuclear weapon. It actually has one less neutron. So weapons-grade plutonium has plutonium-239 in it. This is plutonium-238, but it has about five kilograms, and that produces a kilowatt or two of power, uh, of which, or uh, thermal power, uh, of which about uh, a little over 100 watts is actually uh, power is produced from. And the rest of the heat you circulate around uh, because Mars gets very cold and it keeps the instruments warm and, and, and operating, and you circulate that waste heat to heat up the rover. Um, so nuclear power will be, in my opinion, the power that'll take us to Mars, take humans to Mars, putting up nuclear reactors and sending those rocket ships uh, to Mars and beyond. It's the reason that this country is the only country to send a probe past Mars uh, because we have plutonium and we produced it in conjunction with the nuclear weapons program. We have this plutonium to send these probes out in deep space where solar panels don't work. So another thing that's really cool, so I was really interested in space and wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid, so I think that's cool. Uh, I was also interested in archaeology. Uh, now, this is an interesting technique. It's basically, think of it like an X-ray, but instead of using X-rays from an X-ray tube like you'd find in the dentist's office, it uses cosmic radiation. Uh, basically what happens is, is high energy cosmic radiation from distant supernova and galactic uh, radiation sources bombards the atmosphere, and when it bombards the atmosphere, you're, you get these muons that are created. Uh, now, muons are these charged particles that have pretty short half-lives that enter the atmosphere and are bombarding us right now. I mean, we're being hit with these muons as we speak. And they'll go through the cargo container, in this case, or through the pyramid, in this case, and by imaging how they're deflected, how they're stopped, you can see, basically, like an x-ray, what's inside uh, the contents of, of whatever you're trying to measure. So uh, back in the, this was like the you know, 1960s, uh, a guy by the name of Louis Alvarez, very famous Nobel Prize winning physicist, uh, decided he would solve one of the questions of the Great Pyramids, whether or not they were these giant chambers filled with treasure inside. And he used this technique of using these cosmic rays and these detectors to basically x-ray the interior of these pyramids. And recently, this has been developed into a tool for scanning cargo containers, which, again, is one of the things that I'm working with, detecting nuclear material coming into this country, uh, by basically just using the natural radiation that's around us. Um, so archaeology, counterterrorism, space exploration. Nuclear science really has an application in all of them. It, whether it's because it's so abundant, there's radiation all around us. We're being bombarded with radiation right now, whether it be because it's just really powerful and you can power spacecraft or communities with nuclear power. 
Uh, it's been really intriguing to me to play around with this stuff. Um, and I've had a lot of fun with it. So I encourage anyone who is interested uh, kind of in science or has any kind of interest in science to, and wants to make a career out of it, think about nuclear science. It's, it's definitely something that has the power to change the world in a positive way. Uh, obviously, we've seen the kind of detrimental effects of nuclear power, but it definitely has the potential to change the world in a positive way. And the other thing along that line is, uh, you know, I've always been a fan of science education, obviously. I think science is how we fix this country's problems. I think we have these huge problems like a global financial crisis and a healthcare crisis in this country. And, and people say they're, they're too big problems to fix. I mean, they're, they're, they're too big. You can't fix them. We just have to live our lives and put stopgap measures in effect to, to kind of prevent them affecting our everyday lives. But I think that the way we solve these huge problems that seem so dire, like the global economy or healthcare, is we innovate our way out. And who are the people who are going to be doing those innovations? Scientists, scientists and engineers. And so I really think that the most noble cause anyone can do is to go into science. And maybe you'll even get famous and you won't have to drive your bike off a cliff in a viral video to become famous. Um, so I think science is really cool. I think that hands-on learning is how you learn science, uh, as was kind of referenced here before. You can't learn science in the classroom, in my opinion, that well. You've got to get out in the field. You have to play with it. You've got to get your hands into it. And when that's nuclear science, that may be a little scary. Uh, but still, I think that's, that's how you learn science. So you know, there, there's lots of projects out there, like this fusion reactor that I, that I built, that you can build in your garage. And I think that's how we're going to get more science and scientists and engineers in this country. That's how we're going to innovate our way out of the big problems we face. So get into science. It's a pretty, pretty cool thing. So thank you, guys.